Thank you so much for joining me today on Just Praise Him Radio. I'm your host, Glenda Lomax, and my job is to inspire you to a closer walk with Christ. Now here's the show. Hello, believers. Welcome to the Just Praise Him radio show. I'm your host, Glenda Lomax, and today we're going to be talking about opportunities in the wilderness. Um, this week, we're going to talk about more about the wilderness because by the end of the end times, the Lord said everybody that is left on the earth will be in the wilderness. Now, you may also be in a physical wilderness. I don't know, but for sure, a spiritual wilderness because he said that would be a time of great refining. Okay, so I lost count a long time ago how many people told me that they are terrified of going into the wilderness after reading The Wilderness Companion. So I want you to understand, though the wilderness is terrifying, it's not all bad. Because a few trips there, and you will have a rock-solid faith that nothing can shake. Okay? So this week we're going to talk about, and I'm going to do a second part in this too, so there's going to be a two-part series, I think. It's what it looks like so far. Um, We're going to talk about some of the opportunities that come to you during a wilderness season. I don't want you to miss any of these. I missed a bunch of these when I was in the wilderness because I was just a train wreck, but opportunities bring blessings, and we need all the blessings we can get when we're in the wilderness, don't we? Okay. Okay, just recently, I saw something about the wilderness I never saw before. I was thinking back over, you know, my wilderness journeys and also the journeys of some family and friends, and I saw something. You know how a lot of times in the wilderness, the wilderness often includes financial lack, like severe lack, like you got to go home and stay with mama kind of lack. And I realized suddenly that we should pay very close attention to whoever we have to stay with in the wilderness because in every case that I can remember it's somebody you have unresolved issues with I had to go stay with my dad so my dad was dying of lung cancer at the time so we really didn't work on any issues and I was a mess that was the first wilderness I had no idea what happened in my life I didn't know what was going on I didn't know what God wanted me to do about what was going on. Everything was just falling apart around me. It was bad, real bad. I don't think I had enough insight or mental focus or anything else at that point to work on any issues. But looking back on it now, that was actually my last opportunity to work out anything with Dad because he died just months later. Okay. Having to stay with someone makes the wilderness so much harder because you don't have your own independence. You don't have control over anything. And the Lord puts you in situations of no control in the wilderness on purpose because he's trying to get you to release that to him. Okay. And if that's somebody that you have to stay with is somebody you've had issues with in the past, that's that much more stressful, isn't it? Okay. So. When I had that chance to stay with that, I wasn't there a real long time. I think maybe a couple of months because when I got there the next day or the next couple of days, I went into Dallas and found some temporary work. So I told dad, I said, I'm, I'm expecting to be called back out to the oil and gas, you know, oil, oil field. And so I'm going to get a temp job and make some gas money because I really thought God was going to put me back in the oil field. I didn't realize that the whole industry had cratered at that point because yeah. Anyway, I didn't know. So, so give this some thought. You should pay just as much attention when someone has to stay with you because it's still the same opportunity and they may need to resolve issues with you or you may need to resolve issues with them and you didn't go to them, so God just brought them to you, okay? And y'all keep in mind, usually somebody can feel when they're not wanted in your home. That is such a sad feeling to have to say someplace where you know you're not welcome. That is such a devastating feeling. Be open to them and and try to be as compassionate as you can. It is possible to make somebody feel really welcome, even if you don't really want them there. It is possible. I will never forget as long as I live, and this happened years ago, like in 2006 or something like that. I went to Oklahoma to visit. I don't remember where I went from. I don't remember where I was. But anyway, I went back to Western Oklahoma for a visit. 
and my great niece, and she is a great niece too, Tiffany, invited me to stay at her house. She said, oh, you can stay with me. I was just staying like one night there. And I was going, I think I was going to visit two or three different places. And she made me feel so welcome. She had a place all made up for me to sleep. She had a Scentsy warmer nearby. And as soon as I walked in, it just smelled so nice. And, and I felt so at home. She cooked this big dinner and she's a really good cook. And I just felt like, oh, she's so happy that I'm here. And I can't remember. And there may have been times when I felt that welcome in my my life, but I don't remember any other time that there was no other times that left such a big impression on me of how welcome I felt as there was that one time. I will always remember that. So opportunity number one, opportunity to resolve issues with somebody you've had issues with in the past. And God may bring you that opportunity at that time because you may not know. I did know, but you may not know that that person didn't have very much time or maybe you don't have very much time. And that may be your last chance. Or God may not be able to promote you to wherever he wants to promote you to because you won't work through what's going on in your head. Opportunity number two, the opportunity to make somebody feel welcome and wanted in your home the way you would want to feel if the roles were reversed. Another new revelation. I just did two podcasts on this. Often before a wilderness journey begins, you pass through a time of blessing. This was a big revelation for me because I didn't realize it. This is part of the test, but we don't see when we're being blessed. We don't think we're being tested, do we? I didn't think I was being tested. And you either get a, like a great high paying job or else that a lot of temptations come with or the Lord sends somebody to bless you with money and gifts and opportunities. Doors are opening. All this stuff's going on. And you're like, wow, this is great. And suddenly the blessings stop. This is when you're fixed to go in the wilderness. The job ends or the people stop blessing you and you're like, what's going on? And you wait a little while, but inside you're like, what happened? You know, did you say the wrong thing? Maybe you didn't say the right thing. I mean, you don't really know what happened. Sometimes you talk about it with people close to you, but they just stopped. No explanation, no hi, no bye, no nothing. No explanation. I have seen this pattern again and again and again with people who are about to go into the ministry. Okay. Okay. And it is a time of testing. I remember when it happened to me. Um, the Lord had a very godly man bless me financially several times in just a few months. And it was the money for me to take a sabbatical from work so I could write the Wilderness Companion. And had the Lord not told me what it was for, I wouldn't have. But anytime I get a money blessing, I go to the Lord and go, Lord, what is this for? Is this for this or is it for this or is it for something I don't even know about yet or what's it for because I don't ever want to misuse it you know but the the Lord knew it would be just about impossible to work full time and do the commute that I was doing at the time and write that book it just I mean I don't think it could have ever happened especially the last part of that book that I had to weep my way through there's just no way I could have worked and done that at the same time so this man gave three large offerings over a period of months and I never heard from him again forever. And I mean, I wrote him thank you notes and stuff like that and emails and he just disappeared. He never answered any of them, or I, but that's okay. You know, he didn't owe me an explanation. I had no right to expect him to be my friend after that or anything like that. I will be forever grateful to him and he will have huge rewards in heaven for that. Y'all know he will because he had to have done that at God's leading. He had to have done it at his leading. So... Um, <laughs> what happened? What happened? When the blessings suddenly stopped, that's usually when you flunk the test. That's what happened to me. That's not what happened to me that time, but there were other times. And, uh, when I was working in the oil field or something like that, and then all of a sudden it's, you know, I remember when I was working in Woodward and we had just been told that week, we got two, two more years on the Fox project. Y'all are in good shape. Okay, great. And the other landmen were like going out and buying cars, you know, and doing stuff like that. And I'm like, y'all better be careful now because this, this thing can end suddenly. You never know. And the Lord told me it was fixing to end. So I stopped all, all extra spending. I started cutting corners, putting money back. And 30 days later, and I knew it was fixing to happen because God had told me it was. And I could just feel it. I could just feel it. I couldn't put my finger on any sign that it was going to happen. But I knew it was going to happen because God told me it was going to happen. 
sure enough, we got a call from the boss saying, we're going to all meet for dinner at such and such restaurant. I have an announcement to make. And I thought, here we go. And um, we went to the restaurant and he said, they shut the project down. Just like that. I mean, and I saw, I felt so sorry for the newer landmen because they were just this look on their face like, they were just shell-shocked, and I felt so sorry for them. That used to be the first thing I taught everybody I trained. Look, this industry is cyclical, and you will not usually see the end of it coming when it comes. Always be prepared. Don't, don't get all crazy. So there you go. But it came to a screeching halt, and then I went into the wilderness. So, all righty then. So if you are, if you're going through that time of really good blessing, be very careful to be on your best behavior. And you'll understand what I'm talking about as we get to some more of this stuff. And also, if you listen to, I did a two-part series, The Test of the Blessing. Listen to that. It will help you. Okay, it will help you. I didn't know I was being tested. Maybe I'd have done a little better. I don't know, maybe not. But no wonder I made so many trips to the wilderness, y'all. I was flunking the test. But the, the test of the blessing, when there's a lot of money coming in over a period of months from a job or from blessings that you're getting or from whatever, is a test to see if you will be loyal to God, devoted, and obedient in everything. I don't mean a little bit obedient. I mean obedient according to his standards, okay? It is also a test to see if you will start looking at a person or a job as your provider instead of looking to the Lord our God who is our provider. Okay? All right. So, here you have opportunity number three. The opportunity not to look to a person or job to be your provider. It is especially dangerous if you were being blessed by money that came through a person. Like in the case of that time when that man blessed me. Which that was not a test, but... Um, the danger is you can start looking at that person and think, well, that's, that's where it's going to come from. That's where the provision is going to come through. No, the provision that comes through people is generally ordained by God. And when it stops, it's usually because God said, you're done there. You're done there. Stop giving there. That's what happened to that church that opened up here in town. As it turned out, I was the only giver up there. And, um, I informed them. When the Lord spoke to me and said, I'm done with you at that church and I don't want you to give any more of my money there. And I said, okay, because tithe money is his money. It's not our money. It's his money. All right. Okay. Now here's another test that comes along with that. If the monies came through a person or a group of people, it is also a test to see if you will try to manipulate the person or the group to give you some more money. Once the blessings have stopped. I have seen people in this test do this in an effort to get the money started coming in again. And it's always so obvious that it's, it's really kind of funny. But they will try to say just the right thing, you know, to see if that starts the money up again. Sometimes they get really angry when nothing works and they never talk to you again. And they, they start blaming the person or the group that the money came through. Trying to manipulate someone like that is spiritual witchcraft, Okay. Witchcraft is done primarily with the mind. And so that opens a door to your mind, to the enemy, to attack your mind. All right. And what that will bring is illnesses, diseases, or depression in the mind. Because you open the door to the enemy. He's not going to sit there and not attack. Oh, I'll think I'll be nice to him today. I want to attack. No, he's going to attack. Okay. You need to repent if you've done that and ask God what else you need to do. So here is the opportunity to resist the opportunity to manipulate people to get something you need or want and to instead trust in the Lord for all your provision, okay? Okay, the Lord says there's somebody, a man, listening to this. You're a man who loves God. You have dark hair. You just heard this and you're thinking, oh, I would never start looking to a person instead of, of him for the provision. But the Lord says, sir, you did do it. And you're lying to yourself and you need to repent. He said you did do it. Okay, one of the very first opportunities that came to me in my first wilderness, which I only partially passed, was the opportunity to serve. This is very important. Y'all get this. I have noticed, looking back over the years, that not only through my own wilderness journeys, but those of others around me, that the Lord always gives you opportunities to serve when you're in the wilderness. 
Honestly, when you're in the wilderness, all you can think of is how do I get out of this? Because you are under so much pressure through your reduced circumstances that you're half out of your mind with fear and worry. And I mean, you, I was a wreck. I was an emotional wreck. More than once, the first one especially, all the way through, because I had no idea what was happening. The other ones, I knew what was happening, but I didn't know how to fix it. And the truth is, you can't fix a wilderness. God puts you into the wilderness, and only God can bring you out of the wilderness. And once you understand that, you'll have a better idea of how to get out of there sooner. Okay, so I went and stayed with my dad, who was dying of cancer. And my sister-in-law, God bless her, cooked all the meals that my dad had a little house on my brother's land. And thank God, because I was commuting an hour and later on an hour plus 20 minutes each way in Dallas rush hour traffic. I don't, I'm sure I don't have to explain that to anyone who's ever driven through Dallas. And I was worn out all the time because I was an emotional wreck. I didn't know how I was going to pay my bills. And I was doing this commute and working all day. And on the weekend, I was trying to take dad out of the house and stuff. So I couldn't fix the situation. So I did what I knew to do which was get a job and do what I could, okay? So anyway, my sister-in-law would bring over two plates for me and dad for dinner. And dad would always wait for me to get home before he would start eating. I guess he got tired of eating alone, I don't know. But So I would fix him something to drink, you know, and I would serve him all his stuff. And a lot of times he would ask me to make him banana pudding. He loved banana pudding, the one that has like the wafers and bananas in it. He loved that. That was one thing that he would eat when he was dying. When he didn't feel like eating anything else, he would eat that. And so he'd ask me to make that a lot for him. And I would bring him his coffee and take him his coffee, you know, in the morning and stuff like that. I did what I needed to do. I'd take him places on the weekend and, um, you know, and he was in a wheelchair by then. And take him to, like, secondhand stores and the places that he liked to go to get him out of the house. Because you're, you know, he, my dad was an amputee. He had one leg that was amputated below the knee not long before he got the cancer. In fact, they found the cancer because of a sore on his foot. They ended up having to am amputate that because he got gangrene. He was not a diabetic, although it seemed like that there's some kind of circulation disorder or something. But then he got the cancer, so he was dealing with all of that at one time. One day, I've never, ever told this story to anybody except I told it to Nicole this morning. One day, I came home from a really long day and a really hard commute from Dallas. And if you've ever experienced Dallas rush hour traffic, I know I don't need to explain that. And I went into the little tiny bathroom to get a hairbrush or something. And there were, Dad, Dad called out to me, there's some uh, shorts there in the sink. Could you wash those up? And I looked at the sink, and there's a pair of Dad's shorts in poopy water. And I mean poopy water. And I was like, I was so exhausted and so just wrung out. I usually cried on my commute home. I prayed my way into Dallas and I cried my way out. That's what I did every day. And one day I was crying so hard when I got a quarter of a mile from my dad's house that I stopped because that's where the graveyard was where my brother was buried. And I sat there and by his grave and just wept because I didn't want dad to see me crying like that and want to upset him. I just, because I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to do, and my mom and both my grown children were in Oklahoma. I didn't even want to leave Oklahoma. I cried all the way to Texas when God sent me there, but you do what God tells you, regardless of how you feel about it, So, or, or I do, but nobody really wants to put their hands in poopy water. I mean, you know, but that day, I was just a mess, and I'm very ashamed to say I walked out of the bathroom and didn't do it, what he told me. I didn't do it. I lost a very important opportunity to serve in humility with that opportunity. And there's no telling how much faster I would have come out of the wilderness if I had just done that one little thing. If I had just said, you know what, let me put a little bleach in here and, you know, get these hung. My dad's dying of cancer. He probably feels horrible. And, you know, I can do this little thing. I didn't do that. I'm ashamed to admit that. And I still remember it today because I didn't do it. And that was 1998, y'all. So, anyway, I was, I'd been saved all of two years when God put me in the wilderness the first time. Obviously, I needed it, though. Obviously. It would not have killed me to wash those shorts out. And part of that was, I think, I felt my dad's controlling side starting to come out. He was a very controlling person when he was in better health. And I think I was resisting that because of the pridefulness that was in me, which was part of the reason I was in the wilderness, no doubt. 
And his controlling side did come out not very long after that. And he started trying to run my life, tell me how long I could be on the phone, when I had to get off. And he never let me sleep past 8 a.m. on the weekends. And I was so emotionally exhausted. He would never let me sleep past 8 a.m. So, I mean, there was no comfort there. Let me just say there was no comfort in that house, except I had a roof over my head and I had food to eat. If conditions had been better there, I would have stayed a lot longer. And because they were not, because my commute increased to an hour and 20 minutes, each way, which began to begin become dangerous because I was so tired and I was so emotional, I moved into, I moved into Dallas. I moved into an extended stay motel, which I would not wish on anyone, by the way. Opportunity number six, we will be given opportunities in the wilderness to humble ourselves, especially when serving. Now, as y'all know, the choice is always with humility is always you can humble yourself or God can humble you. You can take your choice. We choose that. My first opportunity to humble myself in that wilderness was when I went to the temp agency and the only job they had that was not temp to perm was under $10. And I was like $9 and something an hour. I was making way more than that when I left my husband in 1987. But, you know, it wasn't about that to me. It was about, you know, I need a job. If it was $7 an hour, it was still more than I was going to make if I didn't work any. So, it was still gas money. I thought I was going back to the oil field. Y'all should have seen the look on my face the day I figured out I wasn't going back to the oil field. Sitting out in my truck, eating a peanut butter sandwich, which I'd taken for lunch at the first temp job, and I was praying, Lord, God, please do something, you know, get me out of here, and he kept not answering me when I prayed, you know, get me back to the oil field, because I was calling people I knew in the oil field, they're like, okay, as soon as this job comes through, you've got a job, and they never came through, and I said, Lord, am I stuck here, and I felt the confirmation in the spirit that I did not want to feel, and I thought I was going to be sick, my blood just ran cold, I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm in a city, I'm alone. I have no savings. I have no credit cards. I'm making less than $10 an hour and he's leaving me here. So I could have taken a job making more an hour if, if I was willing to take a temp to perm job on it and then bail when I got a call from the oil field. I don't believe in doing that. I think that's wrong because it would have been dishonest to say, yeah, I want to work for your company and, you know, do that. I, I just... So opportunity number seven, the opportunity to walk in integrity and resist compromising to gain something. Personally, I think my integrity is worth a lot more than two or three dollars an hour. Can I just say that? All right. When you're in the wilderness, look for the opportunities the Lord gives you to serve with a humble heart. Just to do it as unto him. If I had thought of it that night, or maybe I didn't even know this then, um, the, you know, the Bible says, do everything that you do as unto the Lord. I could have washed out that pair of shorts like I was doing it for Jesus. He would have honored that. He would have blessed me in some kind of way for that. But mainly, I would have been in obedience. I would have got out of the wilderness sooner. I know I would have. Humble yourself or God can humble you. Look for opportunities to not compromise. There is always a temptation when we are in reduced circumstances, especially when you don't have the money to do anything like that. When you are just broke, you can't even meet your obligations. I had a truck payment back then. Um, you can't even meet your obligations. There's always going to be temptations to compromise your integrity to make more money or get money someplace you should be getting it from. Okay. Look for those and resist compromise. So I left dad's house and I moved into the extended stay motel. And it was about, if I remember right, about 30 minutes from the job. Instead of an hour and 20 minutes, it was 30 minutes, which was much safer for me to be driving. Because I was getting home to dad's house way after dark. One night I had a flat. And my brother had to come fix my flat. Poor brother. I hated, oh, I hated that extended stay motel so bad. Suffice to say, those walls are as thin as typing paper. And the people in the room adjoining mine were very active, night and day. Okay, so now I'm in a motel. And I'm making about enough to pay my truck payment insurance in the motel. And that's it. That's it. And almost nothing over. And where I worked, there was no overtime. I worked at a bank. Or it, I worked for Bank of America. It wasn't a bank. I worked in one of the offices. But So now I have to decide. I've been tithing all this time. And now I have to decide, will I keep tithing or will I eat better? Okay. 
I kept tithing all through the, I was commuted back and forth into Dallas, staying at dad's house. Bill collectors were calling me night and day, y'all. Day and night. I would be driving to work. They'd call me. I'd be driving home. They'd call me. It was bad because I couldn't pay the stuff that I had bought uh, when I was in the oil field. So that, that's a bad place to be. So I decided, even at the extended same hotel, that I was going to keep tithing. Regardless of how little I ate, I was going to keep tithing because I could pay the motel and I could pay my truck payment and my insurance and, and enough gas to get back and forth to work. And I was believing God things were going to get better and I was going to tithe. I'm like, I'm not going to give because that's a promise I can stand on. The promise of the tithe. He'll open the windows and pour me out a blessing. He'll rebuke the devourer for my sake. I could stand on that. So I had to have something to stand on. That was the only thing I had. I wasn't about to give that up. So I was eating lunch on $5 a week. Y'all ever try to do that? That's You have to get real creative. So what I would do is I would just go to all the places around my work that had something for a dollar. And I would try to eat good during the day because at night I was eating peanut butter, ramen noodles, you know, that sort of thing. So I wasn't eating very good at night. But that's okay because you get through that. And even if I'd fasted those lunches, it wouldn't have killed me. But Friday would come. I never had any money on Friday. I don't remember ever having a dollar left on Friday during that time period. And I would pray and say, Lord, could you send somebody to take me to lunch? I'm really hungry. And I can fast it if you want me to, but I'm really hungry. And, you know, I would have to get through all of Friday afternoon until 5 o'clock otherwise. And he would always send somebody by to take me to lunch. Always. Every single time. And we'd go someplace good, too. Uh, this one manager I worked with, she used to take me to Humperdinks all the time in North Dallas. And Humperdinks had a blackened chicken plate that was out of this world. And I would always order the same thing because it was so good. So I got to eat good at lunch. At least on Fridays. But that, I think, was God's reward because I didn't compromise and say, no, I'm Lord, I need this money to eat. I can't tithe to you now because I need this. You, you can't need his money, okay? You can't do that. It's not okay. I'm just telling you. All right. So <laughs> I was constantly in prayer. I'd be sitting there typing stuff at work, and in my mind, I'd be praying. It's a wonder I wasn't typing out the prayers. And I would just pray and pray and pray because so I was so scared I was so scared opportunity number eight the opportunity to obey God in the face of the lack and extreme lack to show the Lord you will sacrifice if you have to to obey him that's a very big deal to him by the way if you do that if you are absolutely saying Lord I don't care what I do without. I'm going to obey this command. I'm going to do this. I don't care if it hurts my flesh. That's the way it is. This brings a huge blessing. So at least I got that one thing right. Okay. One of the things I had to learn in that first wilderness that helped me and everyone after that was opportunity number nine. Learn to trust God with where my life was going. Because I had no clue. Can I just tell you that? I mean, no clue. I didn't know what was happening. I didn't know why everything fell apart. You know, I went to work every day. I did what I was supposed to do. As far as, you know, working hard and everything. I didn't understand what had gone wrong. Where my life was headed was completely out of my control. Completely. I was barely surviving. And I still had no idea why it had all happened. I had given him my life two years earlier. And although I didn't expect my life would suddenly be a bed of roses, I didn't really expect it to turn into a scary nightmare either. So so I came to the point where I had to say, okay, Lord, I have no idea what's happening. But I know you're still God and you're still in control. So I'm just going to try my best to obey you. And I'm going to trust you with wherever this is going because I don't know what else to do. And I was constantly listening to the word of God. I listened to a program. I remember I'd drive into Dallas every day listening to The Journey. There was a DJ on it by the name of Tom Dooley, who has since passed away, unfortunately. He was so good at doing that show. And I remember thinking, I wish that I could encourage people on the radio like Tom Dooley does. I think I probably prayed that at that point. But he, some of his shows are online, but he just was so encouraging that no matter how hard what you were going through was, you could listen to his very calming voice for a while, and you just felt better, at least temporarily. So, opportunity nine led me to opportunity ten. The opportunity to be led into a promotion, even when it didn't look like one. 
even if it looks like nothing we, <laughs> we ever imagined a promotion would look like, and especially if it looks that way. Okay. 1 Corinthians 2 says, But as it is written, I hath not seen, and ear hath not heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. All my life, since the age of 12, I wanted to write books. When I got into my 20s, I really, really had a desire to be a motivational speaker, but of course I had nothing to speak about. I wanted to work from home. Guess what? He answered all three of those prayers. All three of them. I had no clue that first wilderness was actually the beginning of him answering those prayers. I had no idea. And I'd prayed those for so many years, but I'd kind of given up that, you know, ain't that was going to happen. I would never have guessed something so painful and so terrifying could lead to anything good, much less what I really wanted for my life. I just wanted to get through it. Okay. We're going to continue this opportunities in the wilderness. I'm going to give, I gave you 10 today. We're fixing to recap those. I'm going to give you 10 in the next one. Uh, but I've also been working on some other podcasts for you. One of the things that I'm working on in the face of everything that we're entering into in the time that we live in is whether or not Christians should defend themselves if they're attacked. Such as if a drug crazed meth head breaks into your house and you have a gun, should you use it? I think it's important to talk about this stuff. I think we need to know where we stand on that. So, you know, what if they break into your house and they start attacking your spouse or they attack your kids or what does the Bible say about that? But we're going to also continue this one. Whichever one I get finished with first is the one I'll do next. So I don't even know. Okay, let's recap the 10 opportunities in the wilderness before we close this. Number one, the opportunity to resolve old issues you have with somebody. Opportunity number two, the opportunity to make somebody feel welcome when they're in their wilderness, which may or may not be during yours. Number three, the opportunity not to see a job or a person as your provider. Number four, the opportunity to resist manipulating others for gain. Number five, the opportunity to serve. Number six, the opportunity to humble yourself while serving. Sometimes really humble yourself. Number six, uh, that was number six. Number seven, the opportunity to walk in our integrity and resist compromising for gain. Number eight, the opportunity to obey God with our money in the face of extreme lack. And I see the video just stopped. Number nine, the opportunity to trust God with where our life is going. Number 10, the opportunity to be led into a promotion even if what we are experiencing looks nothing like what we ever imagined a promotion would look like. I hope this podcast has helped you. I want so much for y'all's wilderness journeys to be easier than mine were. I want y'all to pass those tests and learn those lessons and come out better, more obedient, and with stronger faith in the end. It will help you so much in what is coming. Hopefully y'all won't be as stubborn and hard-headed as I was and you won't have to make as many trips. Jesus bless you. Thanks for listening. Y'all have a great week. Thank you so much for tuning in today to Just Praise Him Radio. You can contact me by mail at my new address, JPH Inc., Glenda Lomax, P.O. Box 60, Glencoe, Arkansas, 72. 72- 539 or by email at jphtoday at gmail.com. JPH is not affiliated with any nonprofit organization, church, or denomination. Have you ever gone through a time in your life where Suddenly, it just felt like your whole life was falling apart. I call these experiences the wilderness experiences. Wilderness experiences are time of great uncertainty and change. Uh, There are times when our faith is tried and refined. After many experiences, the Lord spoke to me to write The Wilderness Companion, which is a virtual roadmap through the desert times of your life. Find out why you've been led to the wilderness. 
Find out what the biggest hindrance is to receiving provision in the wilderness. Find out what the seven temptations of the wilderness are. Drastically cut the time you spend in the wilderness by learning how to partner with the Lord instead of working against Him. Every Christian needs to read The Wilderness Companion. It's by Glenda Lomax and it's available on Amazon.com or WingsOfProphecy.com. Amazon.com, The Wilderness Companion by Glenda Lomax. Are there areas of your life you just can't seem to overcome in, no matter what you try? Are you plagued by poverty, lust, or failure? Do you recognize your predisposition to commit the same sins committed by your forefathers? Do you want a better life? Many people live their whole lives under generational and other types of curses without understanding they can be free. Learn what the scriptures say about curses and why they are still relevant today. Learn how to defeat every one of them through the power of the cross of Jesus Christ. Hosea 4.6 says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. You can break the curses off your life and start experiencing breakthroughs like never before. Read about different types of curses and how to break them, including barrenness, a curse that causes miscarriages and prevents pregnancies, fear, a curse that brings a plague of fear and anxiety. Illegitimacy, a curse that causes lust, rebellion, and sexual dysfunction. Get the book, Loosed from Chains of Darkness, Destroying Curses Through the Power of the Cross. Available now on Amazon.com. Available in print version, Kindle version, and new audiobook. Chapter 15, Curse of Illegitimacy also known as the Bastard Curse. What is the illegitimacy curse, also known as the Bastard Curse? What does it cause, and how can you tell if you're living under it? Deuteronomy 23.2 A bastard shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord. Even to his tenth generation shall he not enter into the congregation of the Lord. A bastard is commonly defined as a child conceived out of wedlock. Notice that definition is not defined by when the child is born, but when it was conceived. A recent study by the CDC shows 40.6% of U.S. births were to unmarried women in 2013, which means this curse is rampant in our population right now. Deuteronomy 23.2 says a bastard shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord, even to his tenth generation. Although scripture does not say definitively how long a generation is, if it is even 40 years, that means this curse continues for a minimum of 400 years on these children and their generations. What happens if someone does not enter the congregation of the Lord? They lose all the benefits of the congregation, also called the assembly in the Strongs. They lose the fellowship, encouragement, and other benefits of being part of the congregation or assembly of the Lord. This curse is lust and rebellion based. Lust because it is lust that causes us to get into fornication instead of waiting on marriage and God's full blessing on our union. And rebellion because fornication is rebellion against God's rules about sex and his way of doing things. Because of the link to lust and rebellion, lust and rebellion will always be seen in the lives of these illegitimate children, usually for their entire lives. This is Glenda Lomax, the author of The Wilderness Companion, with an exciting announcement for you. The book the Lord led me to write to help us to get through the wilderness or desert seasons of our lives. This book has now been made into an audio book. You can get a free copy of this audio book with an Audible trial. If you go to audible.com or if you go to amazon.com and you sign up for their free trial period and request The Wilderness Companion, you'll get it absolutely free.